Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Well, of the cancers that affect both men and women, cancer of the colon and rectum is the second leading cause of cancer death in the U.S. Now, that's according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. But there is some good news. Colorectal cancer is also one of the most preventable cancers if people get the recommended screening. Now, most cases of colon cancer begin as a small, non-cancerous, benign clump of cells called a polyp. But over time, unfortunately, some of these polyps turn into colon cancer. Because these polyps may be small and produce few, if any, symptoms, doctors recommend regular screening tests to help prevent colon cancer by identifying and removing polyps before they can become cancerous. March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month. Here to discuss colorectal cancer is gastroenterologist Dr. John Kissel. Welcome to the program, Dr. Kissel. It's nice to meet you. Yes, nice to meet you too. Thank you very much for having me. Dr. Kissel, great to have you on the program. Great to meet you. We want to talk about colon cancer because this is the month we're supposed to talk about it. <laughs> That's why we have it. All right. And the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the United States, and I, uh, if I'm correct, if you don't smoke, it's the cancer that's most likely to kill you. That's in fact correct. So lung cancer is still number one, uh, but that incidence of that cancer is slowly decreasing as fewer people are smoking. Is it also fair to say that it's a, the, one of the most easily prevented then, too? Yes. So colorectal cancer has often been called uh, the most preventable but least prevented cancer due to the fact that um, probably only 50 to 65 percent of people participate in screening programs. And that's far less than uh, there are people who participate in some of the other screenable cancers at the population level. Uh, We think probably 75 to 85 percent of women comply with mammography for breast cancer prevention and uh, pap smears for cervical cancer prevention. So we have a long way to go with colorectal still. Fairly common cancer. Do, Do we have any idea, do we know what causes it? Well, we know it affects about 1 in 20 in the general population, and then we know that there are modifiable and non-modifiable risk risk factors that will probably um, alter that risk. Um, We know that diets that are high in red meat or saturated fat, carrying around excess weight, smoking, those are modifiable risk factors. Alcohol. Alcohol does also play a role. Now, these are relatively minor, I don't mean to dismiss them, but they probably will modulate risk by about 20 to 30 percent. There are other factors that we can't modify, like our family history and and our age uh, and our sex. So it's more common in men. Uh, It's more common if you have first-degree relatives with colon cancer, and it's more common as we get older. Does, if it starts off in a polyp and then, you know, they want to get it before that polyp becomes cancerous, does everybody get polyps? We think that just about everyone will have a polyp before it turns into cancer. There are certain individuals with high-risk genetic syndromes in whom the polyps grow so quickly Mm -hmm. that we go in and we just find the cancer. But that probably applies to just a small minority of patients who are at risk, maybe 5% of people or less. Age is the most important risk factor. It's uncommon to see colon cancer in younger individuals, but you do. Yeah, unfortunately, there's there's new data that's coming out uh, that says that, you know, while we knew that maybe about 10% of people who get colon cancer are under the age of 50, uh, there's some new population-level data that was just released late last year that shows that maybe that incidence rate is starting to slowly creep up among individuals aged 40 to 50. And it's changing the way we're looking at screening, but thus far there have been no formal guidelines that have suggested that we lower the average risk screening bar to 40 years of age. That may be done in certain uh, individualized circumstances that would be discussed between a patient and their doctor. Because right now it's when you turn 50 is when you should have your first colonoscopy. Yeah, by and large. For the average risk general population, it's age 50 and up. What about symptoms? If you do have colon cancer and it isn't detected early or isn't detected on, on some kind of test, what symptoms might you have? Well, that's the really unfortunate part. So once symptoms develop, A, they can be nonspecific, and B, they can often indicate advanced stage disease. So if you're starting to have problems like a change in bowel habits, if you're noticing anemia, blood per rectum, unintentional weight loss, abdominal pain, all of those should certainly be investigated. And the minority of the time would any of those actually herald a cancer. But if you have a cancer that presents with symptoms, it's usually going to be at advanced stage and harder to treat uh, or even not curable. And that's why we really emphasize that people come in for a preventative screening exam when they're feeling well. 
I, I don't want to go back to polyps again because I think uh, lots of times the fear that comes with this, you know, people don't want to go in for a screening because what if they find something and then what dur- they finally go through with it and then there is a polyp that we don't really know if we like the looks of that or whatever the situation. And so I kind of want to help people <laughs> that are maybe a little nervous about this. How often when you see a polyp that looks a little suspicious or doesn't look right do you take that polyp out right away or how often is that suspicious looking polyp really trouble yeah that's a great question um when we do colonoscopy uh we are expected to try to find a polyp at least one in four times that we do an exam we should find a precancer if we're looking hard enough that's a, a an across the board minimum uh, industry standard Uh, When we do find polyps, we try to remove them uh, almost all the time so that we can have one of our pathology colleagues do a detailed examination under the microscope and tell us whether it's a precancer or not. And if it is a precancer, we look for certain types of features under the microscope that might give us a sense of how quickly it might grow, and that gives us a sense of what to anticipate for that individual in the future. Would we bring them back in five to 10 years? Would we bring them back in three years? Would we bring them back next year based on what we found? You mentioned that people who have symptoms often come in with later stage disease. Help our audience understand what you mean by stage. That's a great question. So when you get a diagnosis of colon cancer, your likelihood of cure is directly proportional uh, to several factors about the tumor, including its size, whether or not it has grown into any structures that are next to the colon, whether or not it has grown into lymph nodes, and whether or not it has spread to other organs. If it's grown into lymph nodes, patients would get chemotherapy after surgery because that's a tumor that has a very high likelihood of recurring or coming back. If it's spread into distant organs, those uh, tumors may not be curable. They can in some instances, so it's good to consult an expert center in the treatment of colon cancer if you're diagnosed. But many patients that have tumors that have spread outside of the colon uh, may receive medicine in order to try to prolong survival, but they may not be curable at that stage, unfortunately. Where um, where does it most often spread to? Which organ does it go to first? That's a great question. Um, Blood uh, from the gut uh, preferentially goes to the liver, uh, and that's from all portions of the intestine, including the colon. And blood from the liver then flows into the lungs, Uh, as part of the the, uh, reoxygenation of blood. And so we most often, when when patients present with metastatic disease or disease that has spread to organs outside the colon, we find it in the liver and the lung. Mm. If that spread is relatively contained, only involving a small portion of the liver or a small portion of the lung, sometimes those patients can receive chemotherapy and receive surgery with the intent of trying to cure them. All right, you mentioned a couple of options for treatment. One, chemotherapy for patients who have had spread of the disease elsewhere. Uh, You mentioned surgery. I assume that the best thing to do is to be able to cut it out if you can. Um, Any other treatment options? Well, uh, actually, depending uh, on where the tumor is located and if it's a very, very early stage tumor, sometimes we actually remove them with endoscopic uh, tools like a a colonoscope. Uh, and sometimes our surgeons can do um, a, a minimally invasive surgery, if, especially for low-stage rectal cancers. They can actually remove just the tumor without cutting out any bowel. Those are um, very uh, specific uh, situations and, and under certain sets of circumstances that those minimally invasive approaches can be used. But if a cancer is found, the majority of the time surgery will be required. One question we often get from patients who are diagnosed is, will I need an ostomy or a stoma bag? And that actually would only apply to the minority of patients. So fear of a stoma should not be a deterrent to getting screened. Going back to that point you made earlier of people being afraid of what might be found. Radiation ever play a role? Absolutely. So primarily for rectal cancers, uh, because the rectum is encased in other important structures down in the pelvis, Uh, Radiation is frequently applied to rectal cancers uh, before surgery in order to try to control uh, local spread of disease and get the best surgical outcomes. We're talking about uh, cancer of the colon during Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month with gastroenterologist Dr. John Kissel. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about screening recommendations plus prevention of colon cancer. And we've got a myth or matter of fact. That's right. I sure do. If I don't have any symptoms, I don't need to get screened. Is that a myth or a fact? We'll find out.
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McCray. We are back talking about colorectal cancer with an expert from the Mayo Clinic, Dr. John Kissel. So, Dr. Kissel, we got a myth or matter of fact. Tracy wants to know. If I don't have any symptoms, I don't need to get screened. Is that a myth or a fact? That is the central myth <laughs> behind colorectal cancer prevention. So we really want to try to uh, perform screening and preventative services in patients who do not have any symptoms. Symptoms are bad. Let's say that you're a talk show host of a, a medical show, and you're <laughs> going to be turning 50 this year, and it's time to get screened. I'm just saying it might be happening to someone I know. <laughs> is the first thing that I'm going to do go and get a go in and have the colonoscopy, or is there other options for me? Yeah, I know. I think that's the first thing you ought to do. <laughs> The prep is what I'm understanding to worry about, but let's. I need to hear it from the horse's mouth over here. Yeah, so as someone who performs colonoscopy, <laughs> uh, I would say that that is a very good screening option. But at this point in time, we do have a variety of different tests that people can choose from, and there are relative strengths and, and weaknesses of each of those tests that probably deserve uh, some form of interactive discussion uh, with your doctor as, as a hypothetical uh, potential patient. Excellent. All right, so I think you should have the colonoscopy, but tell us about the other options. So um, the other options probably in order of discovery would include the flexible sigmoidoscopy, which is sometimes combined with a stool test for uh, invisible blood or occult blood, uh, or sometimes combined with an x-ray. That is a pretty good test for finding polyps and possibly cancers on the left side of the colon, but it really does not look at the whole organ. It, so why would you do that instead of the, the whole shot? Well, if you find a polyp on the left side of the colon, then a patient would be referred for a full colonoscopy. But there are uh, people who've argued that uh, the flexible sigmoidoscopy, because it only looks at half the colon, uh, is potentially, a, a, that's the major drawback of the test. Um, not to be be crude, but people have compared it to mammography of the left breast alone, for hmm. instance. Um, we know now that probably half of the polyps and half of the cancers occur on the right side of the colon. Sure. So you should probably look at the whole thing. Uh, tests that can do that, another one is CT colonography. And I think that that's a relatively sensitive test for polyps and cancer. Uh, it's often, unfortunately, not covered. Uh, it's not yet covered by Medicare, but it is available to some select patient populations. Uh, it's available for Mayo patients. Do you still have to do the prep? You still have to do the prep. And see in order prep. to see, yeah, in order <laughs> to see the polyps and the cancer, they also have to put a balloon in the patient's rectum and inflate the colon with air in order to take good quality pictures. But that's an important point is that the prep is required. Is it, I mean, like I'm, we're joking, but the prep is the part that everyone says is the worst part of it. I hear that mm -hmm. many times in a given day. Is there any yeah. research being done to improve the prep part of a colonoscopy? There are, um, there are new prep options which are better tolerated, but there are two other options for screening that don't require prep at all. The oldest of those uh, would be a test for occult or invisible blood, and that's a test that is applied uh, in a patient's own home. Uh, they provide their own sample and send it in. Mm -hmm. they, that test has to be done every single year in order to be effective. Uh, but there is good data uh, that shows that that test will lower the mortality rate from colorectal cancer, but to a modest degree, maybe about 15% compared to not getting screened at all. Okay. I haven't heard you mention Cologuard. Well, the newest option <laughs> uh, on Q is... I'm, I'm trying uh, to save you here, Tracy. <laughs> yeah, the, the multi-target uh, stool DNA test, uh, which was co-developed here at Mayo, is another prepless option that uses a, uh, a stool uh, blood marker, uh, hemoglobin, but it also uses several DNA markers that are found in colon polyps and colon cancers. And those are assayed from uh, the stool by a, a single uh, central clinical laboratory. Uh, to get that test done, a patient's doctor uh, needs to register with that laboratory. Uh, they issue a prescription for the test. It's sent to the patient. The patient doesn't have to do any prep or skip any medications. They provide a single sample. Uh, it's picked up by a commercial uh, carrier and brought to that central lab. And then the doctor will receive a result, positive or negative. Uh, patients who are positive will then require a diagnostic colonoscopy to evaluate that test result. Is it good test? And, and who is it for? 
So this is for average risk uh, patients. So this is not yet approved for patients who are known to have overwhelming family history or genetic syndromes that predispose to colon cancer. We don't use it in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, I think it's a good test, but I have to uh, caution you that uh, I have a conflict of interest with the test being part of the investigative team here at Mayo uh, that helped develop it. Now, there is some evidence that it is just as good as colonoscopy for detecting colon cancer. True? Yeah, for colon cancer, uh, the sensitivity of the multi-target stool DNA test, a.k.a. Cologuard, uh, is 94% for stage 1 and stage 2 cancer. Those are the ones that we want to catch uh, in comparison to colonoscopy. Stage, stage 1 and stage 2 means localized or just barely spread outside the colon? Curable stage. All right. I guess we need to talk about prevention because uh, it's, a, it's a common condition. You said, what, one of every 20 adults is going to get cancer of the colon and or rectum. If there is anything you can do to avoid that, obviously we'd want to do it. What's your advice there? Yeah, I think um, screening is the number one step, and I'd say the remainder of measures probably boil down to common sense things that your mom told you when you were very little. Um, don't smoke, don't drink to excess, probably eat a balanced and healthy diet where you're getting uh, liberal quantities of uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, probably avoiding heavily saturated uh, forms of fat in the diet, uh, potentially from animal sources. Um, exercise regularly and then see your doctor uh, for regular preventative services uh, comprehensively, not just for colon cancer. Did I hear you say that red meat, too much red meat can cause colon cancer or is a risk factor for colon cancer? Well, we've worried about whether or not too much red meat is a risk factor, but that's very difficult to study. So we know that diets that are high in saturated fat may be associated with the risk. Those may be high in red meat as well, but it's difficult to tease those apart. Sometimes people who like to eat a lot of uh, red meat or saturated fat might have other high-risk behaviors like smoking or drinking. So they're very, di very difficult to study those factors in isolation. And finally, what is, where's research taking us for colon oh, cancer? Just a second. I want to ask you one more thing. What about aspirin? There, I've seen some stories that suggest that taking aspirin can help prevent colon cancer. Yeah, we think it can, and we advise that and other chemopreventative strategies that would be medicines taken specifically to prevent the disease uh, in the patients that are at the highest risk of developing it. So when you look at the statistic of 1 in 20 people getting cancer of the colon in their lifetime, unfortunately, um, a higher percentage of people will bleed if they're chronically taking aspirin. So we advocate the use of those preventative medicines in people who are at higher than average risk uh, there are patients with their doctor's permission who may opt to take aspirin as a prevention measure, but that's not yet fully endorsed for the general population. We have about 30 seconds left, so tell us what, where is the future going? What is the research? Yeah, I think where the future is really going is uh, looking at being able to screen for multiple cancers at once. That's something that our research program is working on here, and we now know that there are competing uh, universities and industry groups around the country that are interested in the same question. So uh, with a stool test or a blood test, could we start screening for cancers that we don't have uh, population level uh, screening services for now? Things like pancreatic cancer, gastric cancer, esophagus cancer. Uh, those are things that we can't really look for because they're in the center of our body and they're difficult to reach with scopes. It's a disease that you need to get screened for because if you do and you catch it early, it's a curable disease. One of the most preventable out there. Absolutely. It's colorectal cancer awareness month and we've been talking with an expert from the Mayo Clinic, gastroenterologist, Dr. John Kissel. Dr. Kissel, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me.